So good morning, everybody. Um, we're just waiting for a few more attendees to join us and um, we'll get cracking very shortly. So we'll be with you in a minute. Okay, well, we seem to have quite a few of our um, attendees with us already. So that's a good start for Monday morning. Um, I think we'll get cracking. We've got a lot to get through. We've got a really jam packed agenda today. Um, I am hoping that Vicky will join us. She's not here yet, but I hear that she is in the very depths of uh, the Ettrick Valley. So perhaps she's having uh, log on problems. Um, but we have got a great set of speakers today. We've got Murdo McKay from the West Harris Trust. He's going to be talking to us about how they've tackled uh, depopulation on the island, on the estate there. We've got um, Professor Russell Griggs joining us from the South of Scotland Enterprise, giving us a bit of an overview of how SOCI are looking to really tackle this issue for the South particularly. And we've got um, our very own Dr. Callum McLeod, our policy director, who will be giving a broader view of Community Land Scotland and our work in this area. Um, we're then hopefully going to be joined by Vicky Davidson, the project manager at Ettrick and Yarrow Community Development Company. Um, they've got quite a big um, project going on at the moment. Then uh, we've got Jamie Little from the Strategic Housing Investment at Dumfries and Galloway Council. And finally, we've got Mike Staples, the CEO at South of Scotland Community Housing. So um, we have hopefully got plenty of time today um, to have Q and A's at the end after all our speakers. So please do put your questions in um, as we go, um, but there will be time at the end. And please do try and use that Q and A facility rather than the, the chat facility. Um, you may hear a, a slight bell sound um, after the speakers have spoken. This is because we're just trying to keep them to time, um, but hopefully that won't disturb your viewing too much. So um, with that being said, I think we'll crack on and hear from Murdo and um, how he can share his experiences at West Harris Trust with us in the South. So thanks for joining us, Murdo. Thank you, Amy. Are you hearing me? Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Bruno. Okay, thanks very much. Um, okay, I'll get straight into the presentation. Um, as you heard, I'm, I'm in, based in the West Harris and the Outer Hebrides. And this first slide, uh, there's a, a website site there as well if you want to find out more information. So this is the West Harris estate. Um, it was all government owned, uh, 7,200 hectares, uh, four common grazings and 52 crofts. Uh, common grazings are obviously a crofting uh, term and not probably used much in the border, but um, next slide, please. This is just a structure of the, the trust at the moment. Uh, directors, we try to have directors from each of the five townships so that there's always a geographical spread, although it's not a large area, it's quite important to have that. Next slide, please. This is the aims of the trust, to revitalize the community by attracting new residents and creating new housing and employment opportunities. Um, and you'll see in a later slide what the position was like prior to 2010 that prompted the buyout in the first place. Next slide, please. This is the our statistics in 2010, a population of 119, only one preschool child. And there was zero business space, no social housing, no private rented housing, and there was no community, community facilities. Next slide, please. So this is our um, probably the flagship development that we, we've got uh, in the sort of distance. You've got our business and enterprise center. And in the foreground, you've got six affordable housing units. And since they were built, uh, there was another four uh, just to the right of those six um, constructed and completed last year. 
And they're now, these six that you see in the foreground are affordable rented housing. And the additional four were um, shared equity. And they've all now been uh, sold. So they're all now occupied. Next slide, please. And that's just a better view of the enterprise center. It's got a, a large community space and a, a restaurant area that's leased out to a private operator. And there's four business units um, on the on the left of that picture that you see. And that's got the artist studios, uh, an architect's business, and a wee chocolate factory as well at the moment. Next slide, please. And in addition to the buildings that you saw, we have hookups um, for camper vans. And um, you'll see the occupancy there. And it's, they've been very, very successful. And um, even during last year's brief tourist season, they were pretty much fully booked for the duration. So they've been a, a good uh, earner for the trust. Next slide, please. And that's just a we that, that's actually improved since that slide was done, but our um, population have increased. And we've actually met the target of 170 by 2020, around the fives. Uh, you can see from the slide there, the business space from we've gone from zero business spaces to eight, social rented housing six, um, and the further four were um, they ended up being shared equity, so they've been purchased. And we've got private rented housing, and it's worth making the point on the, the housing that the trust, the West Harris Trust, also um, sold off sites, affordable sites, and those sites uh, have a burden on the title, so they can only be sold in the future for permanent residents. And to do that, the trust had to become a registered social landlord, um, and we're probably looking to do some more of those types of developments in the future as well. Next slide, please. And this is another of our aims, create sustainable energy for the community via small hydro and micro wind projects. So you can see there we've got one small hydro and we've got two of the larger turbines and a smaller turbine as well. Um, next slide, please. This is just a continuation of the, uh, the big center that you saw. That's half of the electricity that comes from that uh, is from renewables and it also supplies some of the neighboring properties. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just another of our aims and you can see some of the natural heritage that we have in the area. And the, the trust and its directors are very keen to preserve and promote that heritage. Next slide, please. And that includes some um, Land management, we've done beach cleans and we partnered with the John Muir Trust and uh, we've, helped. we've had volunteer groups up from the John Muir Trust every summer since we've um, started on this activity and it's, it's gone very well. And these are some of the other activities that we're involved with. We have sporting rights on the estate and also a cockle fishery on the stand that we're looking to manage more sustainably for the future. Uh, next slide, please. This is another of our aims is to enhance the education of the community of West Harris and cultural heritage and history. Um, it's a strong Gaelic speaking community in the past, and we like to uh, promote some of that history and heritage, both to visitors and residents. And these are some of the events that we held over the last few years. Uh, next slide, please. And it's just a continuation from the previous one, so we'll just go on to the next slide. This is, um, unfortunately, despite our efforts uh, to replenish the population, the school, uh, the only school in West Harris actually did close a few years, a few years into the, um, the buyout, um, but the, we managed to acquire that off the local authority for a reasonable sum. And we're now looking at, it's currently being redeveloped and it's um, being used for uh, tourism businesses and also to business uses offices to let that in the building as well. Um, we're looking also at more affordable housing. 
the fiber optic broadband that's pretty much been rolled out across the area now there's still a couple of small villages still to get it but other than that it's um it's done uh, we were looking at a community share offer for more uh, or different renewables and um, we'll, we'll look at sort of on hold at the moment and we might look at that in the future next slide please I think that's me. Brilliant. Thanks, Murdo. Um, I've got a few questions, but I'll save them till the end. And then I hope other people will be able to pick your brains too about, about your project and all the work you've done. So thank you for sharing that with us and being brief. That was perfect. No problem. Happy to answer any questions. Are they going to be available or written at the end? Well, they'll be written in the Q&A and then I, I will read them out for you. Okay, thanks so much. All right, cheers. Yeah. Great. So that's Murdo giving his perspective on uh, West Harris and what they've been up to there. Um, so now I'm really pleased to um, invite Professor Russell Griggs to speak from the South of Scotland Enterprise. Um, and Russell's going to give us a bit of an overview of um, how SOCI are looking at this issue. So over to you, Russell. Thanks, Amy, and good morning, everybody. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's a lovely sunny morning in the south of Scotland, so hopefully it's the same wherever you are. Um, I want to talk a wee bit this morning about rural repopulation and what the challenges are we have in the south of Scotland, and then talk a bit more about what we're going to do about that. Um, this, the area that south of Scotland Enterprise covers, which is basically Dumfries and Galloway and the Scottish borders, has got about 264,000 people in it which is a population of 24 people per, per square kilometre, which compares with 132 per square kilometre for the rest of Scotland. But it's the demographics, it's how those split up that's the challenge. So next slide, please. So you can see that um, in the place we are, um, we've got fewer working age people and more, um, people over the age of 65, um, and that will get worse. So by 2041, if we didn't do anything about it, we would have the same number of working age people as we do um, retired people, which wouldn't be a good balance. Now, all these numbers I, I know always look very good, but what we've tried to do is consolidate that down into something that the population understands in terms of what they need to do. And in reality, what that means is just to stay where we are, which is not a great place, but just to say where we are, we need to encourage 800 new working age people to come or stay in the south of Scotland every year uh, for infinity. And if you work that out and what that looks like in terms of something real, that means that we have to have, um, if you add their, their husbands and wives and spouses and everything else, we have to create a community the size of Langham every year because um, that's got about 2,200 people in it. So that's the size of the challenge. We have to commit, commit a new, sorry, create a new com community of the size of Langham every year. Um, so that's where we start. So how do we do that? So do you want to move on to the next slide, please? Uh, the act that we operate, uh, and that is quite different from um, other people's act in that we have further sustained have to further the sustainable economic and social development of the south of Scotland and improve the amenity and environment. Uh, but the Act gives us specific examples of the activities we should carry out. So we should be create opportunities through inclusive economic growth, promote improve infrastructure digital through digital and transport, increase the number of, of residents in the south of Scotland, which is what we're talking about this morning, and supporting communities to help them meet their needs and about supporting the community ownership of land. And that fits in nicely with one of the um, paragraphs that's in the um, Community Land Scotland Manifesto, which is about increasing the support that Scottish enterprise agencies do in this area. And that's really important to us to create um, community trust, to create sustainability across all we do. And I'll come on to talk about in a little minute about what that means in terms of the type of projects we do. So next slide, please. So our vision is to establish the South of Scotland as a centre for opportunity, innovation and growth, 
and that we hope will keep our young and old people here, but encourage more to do that. And we will work with the people in businesses and communities right across the south of Scotland to grow its economy by providing investment, expertise and mentoring. And that will inspire the region to think bigger and unlock significant opportunities for all. And we're in the middle of creating a regional economic strategy with our partners in the private, the public, the third sector to look at what our North Star will be over the next the coming decades um, in terms of what we want um, to produce for the south of Scotland. Next slide, please. So we're going to do this by doing a number of things. And again, that fits into, I think it's another paragraph in the Community Land Scotland Manifesto, which is about um, helping build capacity in those areas to um, make sure that we, we have the people there to do it, um, that we have a good bunch of people who have a good look at what they want to do. So that will mean that we'll build and strengthen communities with joined up economic and community support, support tailored support to empower communities to develop and realize their aspirations to make the south of Scotland an even greater place to live and work in. And that's really important because we've been doing work over the last three years to look at what the challenges are. And in the past, our belief is, and it's interesting, that's what the new Town Centre Action Plan document says, that one of the challenges is we don't spend enough money at the beginning, making sure that we've got good business plans and that means we need to build capacity in the communities. And that's what we're really trying to focus on doing. So we, we've spent over the last few years not a, an awful lot of money on feasibility studies, but that has helped all the communities to think better, cohesively join together. And if I take the place I spoke about a minute ago is Langham. When we started work with Langham two, three years ago, they had 43 different community organizations for a population of two and a half thousand. That's now down to one overarching community organization that still keeps all the other community organizations working together, but has produced a great business plan for the community all the way through to 2030. We want to help projects and organizations to reach their potential and become more enterprising and sustainable. And finally, we want to influence national policy on behalf of communities in the South um, through, the, for example, the Scottish government's population strategy. Next one, please. And just to show what we're doing, we'll pop up three um, uh, projects we're involved in. Uh, first one's the, uh, I stay in Langham for a minute, Eskdale Foundation, which is looking to provide the funding to complete the redevelopment of the old police station and then to four flats, which is available for, for affordable renting. And as you probably all know, we help the Langham community to buy a large chunk of Langham Moor. Um, yes, to develop as a tourist attraction, but also again, to look at how we might look at rural um, housing. And the car, we've been working with Cars Fairn, um, Car Through Woodland, um, to provide support to develop and strengthen the proposed community woodland project, including marketing expertise, site design, etc. And finally, up in Ettrick, uh, we've been working with the community on two projects. One is the transfer of some land from FLS to themselves. Another, and more importantly, which is the development of a community, uh, an old steading, into a series of houses and workshops. Um, to allow them to take that forward. And we, we allocated that money last week at our board. So that will allow now them to develop that. And in the essence of that, that's about bringing more families into the Ettrick Valley, which will keep the school at the primary school open, et cetera. So that is very much an economic development agency doing something with a community outcome as well as a financial outcome. So and finally, next slide, please. So if you want to keep us up, want to speak to us, that's how you get in touch with us, all, all of that stuff um, that we need to know. But repopulations are really at the heart of what South of Scotland Enterprise is about. Because if we don't increase the number of working age population in the South of Scotland, we're going to be in real trouble by the time we get to 2040. And again, as we move, we move to net zero, and we want to start to look at how we introduce things like um, air source heat pumps, and EV points for electric cars all over the south of Scotland. 
they were going to be the workforce, the local workforce to help put those on today. So I've got one more slide, but I just think that says thank you. So thank you. Thank you, Russell. Um, and it's really good to see that uh, the work's now really starting to pay off and then these uh, projects and initiatives are, are coming to light. So um, lots of good things coming for the south of Scotland, it seems, which is great. Okay, thanks very much for that. So we'll now move on to um, Callum, who is going to be speaking to us with our Community Land Scotland perspective on the work we're doing with uh, rural repopulation. So thank you, Callum. Uh, thanks very much, Amy. Um, and thanks as well, obviously, uh, up from Community Land Scotland to add my, my thanks to everyone for taking the time to um, participate in this, I think, really timely event with regard to um, development in, in the south of Scotland and of course the, the hugely important um, issue of, of rural repopulation within that context. Um, if, if you bear with me, I'll share my screen so we can get my uh, presentation uh, up. Okay, um, so hopefully you can all uh, see uh, my presentation here. What I basically want to do is speak to you um, for a few minutes on the um, topic of rural repopulation, obviously, but, but more specifically around uh, the um, issues and initiatives and, and the work that Community Land uh, Scotland uh, as an organisation has been doing in this field, really probably for certainly at least uh, the, the last three years, probably longer as well. So I'll talk a little bit about um, some of that work, uh, particularly around um, stuff that we've been doing with regard to the Planning Act that was introduced in 2019, and what the implications of that have been. I'll then talk more specifically around um, our manifesto for the Scottish Parliament election, which is um, coming up, obviously, as we all know, in May. Uh, we have a number of uh, specific um, proposals that we have included in our, in our manifesto that relates specifically to rural repopulation and ensuring that our rural communities can thrive through uh, having more people living and working in uh, them for, for that. So let me begin though, before we, we get to that, by um, talking briefly about the relationship, and this has been alluded to already, the relationship between land reform, community ownership, and what I think we're all uh, looking to achieve, which is sustainable and resilient communities and places. Um, now we, as an organization, have been very unambiguous that we see a very clear relationship between uh, land reform, which we define, and which the Land Reform Review Group um, report of 2014, a Scottish government commissioned a group um, and its report uh, defined as a changes to the ownership of land or the use of land in the public interest. Now, we think that's a really important uh, definition because uh, particularly focusing on the public interest when we think about how, and how land is owned, who owns it and what they're doing with that land uh, to deliver the whole range of public and essentially as well community benefits. Um, to help achieve these sustainable places. And as we've seen already from uh, Murdo's presentation with regard to, to West Harris, community ownership opens up lots of opportunities in order to, to deliver on these public and community benefits, not least uh, in relation to uh, repopulation itself. And so that, those kind of relationships, and that relationship between land reform and community ownership as a mechanism, not the only mechanism, but an important mechanism to actually deliver uh, that overarching set of objectives we see as, as very, very important. Let me um, move on and, and talk particularly around uh, some of the uh, engagement that we had in relation to the planning system and specifically the um, Planning Act of, of 2019. Um, when the consultation process for that uh, act was being undertaken, Community Land Scotland uh, responded to it and we made a number of different uh, proposals with regard to what was included in the um, consultation document itself for what that act might look like. Uh, we then went slightly off piste because we talked about the need to have rural repopulation and resettlement 
uh, as part of the planning system in order to meet the, um, the demographic and depopulation crisis that we're all very familiar with uh, in the south of Scotland and indeed, indeed elsewhere. Now, these proposals in terms of repopulation, particularly around resettlement, garnered, as you can see from the right hand side of the screen, uh, quite a lot of media attention at the time. And it was kind of framed around, uh, as you can see from some of the headlines, the notion of, of reviving heritage lost to the Highland clearances. Now, I'm very conscious that we're talking here about the south of Scotland, frankly, who did not, who, who also uh, endured quite significant. Uh, transfers and at uh, uh, that period of, of history as well. But it, it captured a lot of, of um, imagination in terms of, of the media and so on. Um, not least, we actually uh, got a, a, a leader in the Times newspaper making it work, which wasn't necessarily hugely supportive, I have to say, uh, because it argued that, high, that communities need jobs, not land to help them thrive again. Uh, well, we argue that they need both. And so that whole dimension of, of uh, linking land reform to community ownership to deliver on repopulation is fundamental to all of that. Um, and we were successful with regard to what we managed to um, achieve with regard to the planning uh, bill itself uh, as a consequence of uh, support from cross party support actually from, from different um, MSPs, we, we got um, a commitment to increasing population of rural areas of Scotland is one of the, the six outcomes for the national um, planning framework for which is currently being uh, consulted on and developed by Scottish Government. We had uh, amendments as well or provisions that, that uh, dealt with making sure that uh, ministers have to have regard for resettling depopulated, depopulated areas as well in NPA4 and also commitments around and making sure that planning, the planning system links into a, the government's and Scotland's land rights and responsibility statement in order to actually address a depopulation and repopulation issues. So that's been a really important development in terms of the Planning Act and what that uh, can do and what National Planning Framework 4 can do in order to assist rural areas in the south of Scotland and elsewhere to actually address uh, the depopulation crisis that, that uh, many of our areas face. Uh, the photograph on, on the, uh, the left hand side, you can see that Murdo uh, again is in that photo in the, in the foreground, was an event that we held, uh, if you can cast your back, minds back to the pre-pandemic -pandem era, um, back at, at the early part of, of 2020 uh, at the Scottish Parliament to just um, highlight and showcase initiatives that community landowners have been undertaking to repopulate uh, their own areas and we were pleased to have a number of speakers here including um, Kevin Stewart, the, the Housing, uh, Local Government and Planning Minister uh, amongst others. So the Planning Act is obviously very important, it's one component with regard to uh, driving repopulation initiatives in rural areas uh, in the south of Scotland and elsewhere. Um, as, as Russell Griggs mentioned though, uh, Community Land Scotland has published a, uh, a manifesto for the upcoming uh, Scottish Parliament election, Land for the Common Good. Uh, we've organised our proposals uh, that we are putting unambiguously to all of the political parties and to uh, whichever uh, party um, forms the next Scottish Government. Um, very clearly around a number of interlinked themes and they are controlling land monopolies to protect the public interest, uh, we see the diversification, and I think this is uh, um, a policy objective that's shared on a cross-party basis. We see the diversification of land ownership uh, in Scotland, rural land ownership as being fundamentally important in terms of delivering sustainable land use and the wider public and community benefits that deliver. So having public interest tests uh, in relation to that within what is at the moment an unregulated land market is fundamentally important in that regard. Um, as Russell also mentioned, we um, have a number of proposals, which I'm going to talk about very briefly, uh, around empowering communities to build local resilience. That idea of capacity and resilience and being able to kind of respond to that is, is fundamental to all of this agenda. We can't escape the overarching um, emphasis on the climate emergency itself while ensuring a just transition uh, to a net zero economy. So what's the kind of uh, element with regard to that? And critically as well, obviously, we have, we have proposals, which again, I'll touch upon uh, with regard to 
uh, repopulating our, our rural places to help them thrive, which is obviously central to what we're talking about here today. And, and quite apart from that, the fifth interlinked theme is around just developing a, a fiscal framework for a fair and sustainable Scotland. So to briefly touch upon two of these overarching themes then, empowering communities to build local resilience. Um, well, there are a number of different proposals that we are, are, are advocating for there. Fundamentally, we see um, the retention of the Scottish Land Fund is essential to all of this agenda from a community ownership perspective and we're calling for an increased budget across the next parliamentary lifespan of £20 million a year. Uh, we think it's important to uh, review and amend the existing suite of community rights to buy in the community asset transfer scheme to just make sure they're fit for purpose and we were pleased to see the report that the local government and communities committee uh, has produced just at the end of last week, which uh, follows its review of the uh, participation and CATS element of the 2015 Community Empowerment Act and says there's quite a lot to be done to enhance uh, both of these dimensions. Critically as well, uh, we want to see an increase in support from Scotland's, Scotland's enterprise agencies for a more skilled and sustainable community land owning sector with regard to community trust development staff and board training and various other elements as well, including business planning support. Now, we've been absolutely delighted uh, at the way in which South of Scotland enterprises really hit the, the ground running with regard to this. Obviously, it's been very supportive to initiatives uh, such as, as Langham uh, and, and, and many other communities as well. And we had a really good session uh, with the board at the end of last year when uh, it, was, it was clear there's, there's commitment to do that. So that level of support and increasing and, and keeping going with the momentum with regard to that sort of support to communities uh, and community trust is a really important dimension of, of what we're doing here with regard to uh, development locally and, and particularly around the, the, the repopulation agenda. Uh, there are issues as well around the Scottish Investment Bank, which we think needs to be uh, clearly located in terms of uh, making sure that we get community led development for social renewal and critically for that green economic recovery that we all need to, to focus on as well. Um, and there are also issues specifically around foreshore um, access to that and, and actually right to, to take ownership with regard to that for, for the foreshore that's owned by the, the Crown at the moment and as well. Uh, to make sure that there are compulsory sale orders that are, are being used to enable public authorities to bring derelict or unused sites or buildings into productive use. These are all tools that can help empower communities through land ownership and sustainable land use to build local resilience, to, to, to bring the sort of amenity, the job opportunities uh, and, and the, the people to rural areas to help them become more sustainable in the longer term. Um, and to focus specifically around um, repopulating our rural places to help them thrive, we've got three distinct elements that we've called for here, although as you can see, a number of the other proposals, and if you read our manifesto, a number of the other proposals that we make link in uh, very clearly in a kind of mutually reinforcing way to this focus on rural repopulation. So our kind of headline proposals and asks uh, to the parties and to Parliament and the next Scottish Government is really around placing a duty on all public authorities with a rural development remit to include measures to, to further rural repopulation as part of their operations. And doing that very specifically and unambiguously through uh, the production of rural repopulation strategies and associated indicators of progress. We need to measure where we are and Russell mentioned the, the very uh, challenging uh, agenda that the south of Scotland faces in terms of um, the equivalent of a, a kind of langham every year almost in terms of having more people in, in, the, in the region itself. We need to have indicators of progress with regard to that and that, that can include and we suggest it should include uh, the transfer of land assets to community ownership. Um, housing as we know is a very fundamental and crucial issue with regard to rural repopulation, of course. Uh, we've called for uh, retention of the Rural and Islands Housing Fund for the duration of the entire, entirety of the next parliament with a budget of at least 30 million as it has currently. We've been pleased that actually Scottish Government, uh, the current Scottish Government has acknowledged uh, that it intends to retain that fund. It's been hugely important uh, and we call for that to have at least the same amount of funding for the, the entire duration of the next parliament. And the third rural repopulation um, proposal we have is really to, to, 
introduced legislation to grant a range of powers to local authorities to take action where they need to with regard to housing, uh, to protect it for local residential use. Uh, and that can include a number of different initiatives, potentially uh, encompassing control areas with different sorts of regulated amendments uh, with regard to that. I'm going to leave you with this photograph, this rather uh, photograph looking into uh, in the south of Scotland here. And, and just to, to, to reiterate uh, the essential points that um, land reform in terms of diversifying ownership and land use in the public interest to facilitate more community ownership as one mechanism amongst others to sustain and encourage more rural repopulation so that we can actually deliver on the public and community benefits for regions uh, such as the south of Scotland is fundamentally important in order to uh, actually ensure that happens. So really looking forward to hearing what others have to say in terms of, of their presentations and also to the, the discussion after that. So thank you very much. Some really pertinent points there. And on a personal note, being in the south of Scotland, currently looking for somewhere to live has been an absolute nightmare. So um, I, I didn't realise when I was running a repopulation event, I would be really in the thick of it personally. Um, so I'm really delighted now to welcome um, Vicky Davidson, who's the project manager at Ettrick and Yarrow Community Development Company. Um, Vicky's going to talk to us about their projects and how they're tackling the issue of repopulation. So over to you, Vicky. Hello, I don't know. Are you going to take that picture down or am I going to talk with that picture there? You can talk with that picture there, Vicky, if you want, or we can take it down. It's up to yourself. All right, whatever. OK, I'm fine with that. So I'm going to talk. Firstly, I'll tell you a little bit about the Ettrick and Yarra Valleys and then a bit about the problem and then what we're trying to do about it with Kirkup Steading. So, firstly, for people who don't know, um, the Ettrick and Yarra Valleys are two very long parallel valleys that stretch from Selkirk all the way up to the Dumfries and Galloway border. And the closest town to the top of Ettrick Valley is actually Moffat which is only about six miles away if you went over the hill road, but it's actually um, from the top of there to Selkirk, it's actually 26 miles away by car. And in fact, to any town from Ettrick village in any direction by car is at least 20 miles. So the greater part of most of both valleys is considered remote rural, but there are five main clusters of population with five village halls, three churches, and until quite recently, three primary schools. And the population is around 850. So I grew up here, I went to school here, and about 20 years, I came back to live here. And in that time, um, there's been quite a lot of changes. So a lot of houses have changed hands and some new houses have been built. In Ettrick Bridge, which is the um, largest centre of population, 15 new houses um, were built and that brought an influx of new children for the primary school. But in most cases, um, the families living in those houses, their children have now grown up, they've left school, and although some still work locally, they've got nowhere now to, the children themselves grown up have nowhere now to live. In Yarra Ford, um, which is five miles from Selkirk in the Yarra Valley, Eildon Houses built some affordable family homes, which were very popular. And in the upper reaches of the Ettrick Valley, five new houses have been built in that period with another one under construction. So in some ways, that all actually sounds quite healthy. So why did one of our primary schools close in 2012? One dropped to only six pupils, although it's now gone up to double figures, and the other one in the Yarra Valley also dropped to four at one point, although it's now also back into double figures. So we've got hardly any empty houses. Um, the few empty houses that we do have are either too far off the road or they're currently um, uninhabitable due to dry rot or, or whatever. So it's not actually because our population has dropped in those 20 years. The problem is that we've got hardly any children and hardly any, well, a reducing number of families of working age. And that is a very common story. 
The farm cottages, which provided cheap rented accommodation, were sold off, in some cases as family homes. No, I mean, in some cases as holiday homes, but mainly as retirement projects. Hill farms bought by commercial forestry investors had the farmhouses sold off. And the rural house prices over the period have been around eight times more than the average wage for the area, if not more. So most of our housing stocks had a lot of investment, but that just means the value is even more out of reach for local families. So um, without the children, without aff affordable family home houses, the community really won't be sustainable. If the schools close, then we won't be able to attract families in the future. And without young people and people of working age, then rural businesses can't develop or thrive. There was one example in the last couple of years where a, a tourism business was doing a 50 mile round trip at the start and end of the day to go down to Selkirk to be able to pick up some young people to work in their business because there just wasn't enough young people locally. Farm businesses are struggling to get seasonal help. So the lack of affordable housing isn't just meaning that, um, it's not just a social problem, it's also a business problem as well. So um, the community development company, um, which I work for, was set up in 2012 partly to address this general feeling in the community that the valleys might not have a sustainable future unless we took ownership of the problem and tried to do something about it ourselves. The board of the development company has been very strong in this. And we've been very lucky to have a good board over that period. Um, so the idea of looking for a steading was one that we tried for a while. We've approached McCleary States. There was two possible steadings. One had no access or a difficult access. So we started negotiations to try and buy Kirkup steading. Um, that was a bit of a stop start process. But finally, with the help of the Scottish Land Fund, um, we negotiate the sale and we took ownership of the steading with all the land that you see in the photograph um, in June last year. So the community, um, Scottish, the Scottish Land Fund was crucial to us, not just for the funds to buy the steading, but also for the advice and help that we um, received along the way in terms of drawing up business plans and the, the other things that we needed. We've since applied to the Rural Housing Fund and we've been successful in that as well, um, subject to our bank loan. And I was very pleased to hear Professor Griggs um, saying that we um, are now have, um, that South Scotland Enterprise are supporting us. So the project is to convert the steading into three affordable homes on one side, two two bedroom houses and one corner unit with three bedrooms, to convert the other side of the steading into business units. So upstairs um, office areas, downstairs workshops with a communal area downstairs where there could be hot desking and, and some meeting space. And two new build semi-detached houses, um, three bedrooms, on the site of what is currently an old Dutch barn. Since we took ownership, we've let the field out to a young farmer who's um, got a small pedigree herd of sheep. And we've installed a borehole on the site because we weren't allowed access to the private water supply, which wasn't going to be sufficient. We're looking to borrow 600,000 to bridge the gap between the funds that um, were being given and what we need to complete the project. It's taken a long time to, well, it's taken a year longer to get to the point where we, we're almost ready to start, partly due to COVID restrictions and the cost of materials um, going up and the cost of, and the risk to, to um, contractors going up, which meant that our tender returns were so much higher than we expected. We had to, to sit down and uh, do a lot of work to try and 
get the costs down and get the um, possible sources of income up. So we're now at the point where hopefully um, we will be starting on site by the end of this month. We've appointed a main contractor and um, yesterday we spent the whole afternoon putting up an owl box to try and move our barn owl into, into a, a better site to make sure there's nothing going to hold us up starting. So that's our project. Um, in terms of what's been crucial to it, absolutely need to continue the Scottish Land Fund and the Rural Housing Fund. I think a strategy by councils for rural repopulation is urgent and overdue. Um, there seemed no recognition that, that the number of young people or children was just, was such a tiny percentage that the rural population wasn't going to be sustainable. Um, I also think we need some help for private landlords to bring disused houses back into use. So there are some houses round about that could be brought back into use, but just not viable um, for a landlord to do it on their own without help. There could be more support for self-build so that people could try and um, work together to put up some affordable housing. And I think the increasing the council tax to for second homes also um, has been very helpful. So that's me. Thank you, Vicky. It's really interesting hearing your project um, and your specific issues that you're tackling and some really um, good suggestions there as well. So thank you for sharing that. Great. So I'll um, now pass on to Jamie Little, who's from the Strategic Housing Investment at Dumfries and Galloway Council. Um, this is Jamie's first or one of his first online presentations. So I hope it goes well, Jamie. And um, thanks for sharing that with us. Thanks, Amy, and thanks, Vicky. Uh, very interesting presentations from everybody. Uh, a, a lot of what's been uh, discussed there are things that I'm going to cover as well from a, a strategic housing authority perspective. Um, I'm, I'm Jamie Little. I work uh, for Dumfries and Gallery Council in Strategic Housing Investment. My remit in, uh, includes uh, parts of work such as the local housing strategy, strategic housing investment plans, housing need and demand assessments, and uh, a few other things as well, which I'll, I'll come on to during the presentation. Um, just for given the not entirely sure where everybody's come from or how aware they are of Dumfries and Galloway and its location, uh, there's, a, there's a short map uh, highlighting we're in the blue area uh, to the, the west of the, the South Scotland, most southerly region in, in the whole of Scotland. Uh, we join the Ayrshires, uh, Lanarkshire, uh, a little bit of Cumbria, here to uh, the south of Gretna and obviously the, the Scottish borders uh, is marked in the red there. Um, for those again who don't know Dumfries and Galloway that well, Dumfries is our main town, 40,000 population, Stranraer in the west with around 10,000 and, and most of it beyond that is, is much smaller uh, and uh, rural areas. Um, there's a port in the west, the link, main link to Ireland. A lot of traffic travels through our region on the way to Ireland uh, and the M74 in the east, uh, which runs from, through Gretna and, and Lockerbie, uh, heading north or south, depending on which way you're coming from. Predominantly, the, the land use in Dumfries and Galloway is either for agricultural or for forestry. Uh, over 90% of the, the land has that, that type of use. Uh, so you can see that there are a number of uh, sort of challenges that are, are recognised in this region. Just again, a quick overview there, Dumfries and Galloway, population around 150,000 pounds, 150,000 people, sorry, uh, not pounds. Uh, we, something that's often forgotten uh, is that the third highest proportion of people living in remote rural areas. Uh, that's behind uh, only the Highlands and Argyll and Butte local authority areas. Uh, and that, that's something we're obviously keen to, for the Scottish Government to recognise, particularly through the Affordable Housing Supply Programme. You know, a lot of people have mentioned the, the need for, for funding, um, but the, the remoteness of the, the whole South, you know, not just in Fries and Galloway, but the borders as well, uh, is something that we, we'd be uh, keen to be seen taken into account when it comes to 
housing investment in the future. Uh, the, the bottom start there, around 50% of people live in the nine largest settlements, so that's over 3,000 people. So for all the, the mathematicians out there, I'm sure you've worked out that means 50% of people don't live in those, those areas. So we have a, a significant number of people living in, in rural areas within Dumfries and Galloway. Some of the, the, sort of the key aspects around that rurality uh, and uh, as, as Vicky was mentioning around school sustainability, uh, we have 98 primary schools in this region, 16 secondary schools, and a quarter of them are, are below half full, uh, which is obviously of, of concern. Some of them are in, in single figures, particularly in the, the primary schools. So we're looking to identify ways through housing to help promote that, those, the sustainability of those schools, but also the sustainability of shops, medical facilities, transport, uh, employment as well, and providing employment opportunities in those regions, in those areas of, of Dumfries and Galloway. So the, the local, these are just some local housing strategy objectives, as I, I said there before, um, part of my remit is to develop in consultation with many of our partner organisations and local communities around some of the, the objectives of, of uh, Dumfries and Galloway as strategic housing authority. Um, you see there the, the top one, uh, new housing development su supports the sustainability of towns, settlements and villages. And that's obviously something we're very keen to do. The whole, um, the whole purpose of a local housing strategy is to maximise uh, the, the, the input of all the different parts of the council, the partner organisations, the funding that's available to try and promote these strategic objectives, not just these ones, but, but wider as well, uh, again, around job creation, uh, around uh, the sustainability of communities. Um, and that's something we're, we're very keen to continue to do across the whole of, of the, the south of Scotland as well. And as Professor Griggs mentioned, we're, we're part of a, a consultation on the, the development of the economic strategy for the, the south of Scotland. Um, in terms of the investment that's identified through the local housing strategy, uh, put investment through the affordable housing supply program, also through energy efficient strategy as well from the Scottish government. And it does, it does create a, a, an environment where there is job creation, job sustainability. Uh, in 2019-20, there was over 19 million pounds from the Scottish government invested in the region, creating around 260 new affordable homes, which uh, goes go some way to, to helping uh, create those job opportunities as well. This is just a brief overview of the, the last housing need and demand assessment that was carried out by the by the Dumfries and Galloway Council. And just highlights some of the points that were raised before around the population decline, uh, predominantly in uh, the 25 to 44 year old bracket in, in Dumfries and Galloway, but also the, the significant increase in the 65, 79 and 80 plus uh, age brackets. Um, another, another statistic is in terms of migration within the region, uh, the, the trend of population decline from rural uh, housing market areas, that's the HMAs there, an increase in the population in our urban housing market areas. So we, we've classified Dumfries uh, and Strunra as the, sort of the urban areas. More people are moving to those for, for multiple reasons, including jobs, opportunities, cost of living. Uh, and these are some of the, the challenges that are being faced in Dumfries and Galloway. In terms of the strategic housing investment plan, this identifies some of the key projects to be delivered uh, by the Scottish Government, so supported through the Scottish Government's Affordable Housing Supply Programme. I've just uh, focused on three particular projects there uh, that are in, in rural areas. Glen Capel is a small village around five miles from Dumfries. Um, and on, uh, that, uh, the, in terms of the school there, it's a very low roll around quarter capacity. So there's a strategic housing investment plan uh, project to develop 22 low cost home ownership homes. Many of them will be family properties. It's a very attractive uh, village, good services there as well. Um, but what we're hoping to do is through this development is to su support the sustainability of the, the school 
um, as, as one of the objectives. They're also very highly energy efficient properties as well. Monmouth is a very rural location. It'd be classified as remote rural. Uh, there's five new affordable homes for social rent being developed there. And Glenluce is a particularly interesting one. Uh, it's a small village, uh, roughly 15 miles from Stranra. Uh, and there's a derelict hotel site within the, the middle of Glenluce, uh, which we're seeking to develop nine new affordable homes in partnership with a registered social landlord. Uh, and th these are obviously very interesting projects um, because they will help support the sustainability of those local communities and also provide some work opportunities, but providing high quality new homes is, is one of the main objectives as well. Um, some projects I know have already been mentioned uh, that we have assisted through the, uh, the council's town centre living fund. So a number of years ago now, uh, the council set up priority to invest in town centre living, setting aside one million pounds per annum uh, from council tax on second homes to help promote the sustainability of town centres. The three, these three projects are of particular interest. Uh, they're being supported through South Scotland Community Housing uh, that Mike Staples, the next presenter, will, will go on to talk about in a bit more detail. Uh, I know that Professor Griggs mentioned the Langham Police Station, but all three projects are the regeneration of existing uh, properties uh, that have had a commercial use in the past, but we're seeking to bring them back into use as affordable housing. The Town Centre Living Fund is intended to be an enabling fund, and with many of these projects, you often find that the costs are, are, are a major barrier in the development. They need that extra little bit of help to get over the line and that's what we've, we've sought to do through the Town Centre Living Fund. But as uh, has already been mentioned, Langham's population is around 2,200 people. Whithorn has a population of around 900 and Wigton around 1,000 people. A small uh, housing project can make a massive difference in these areas, um, but they can be expensive to deliver. Uh, finally, just touching on uh, the Borderlands Inclusive Growth Deal, which is something that uh, is obviously fa fairly familiar to some people, but those are just some of the objectives around the Borderlands Inclusive Growth Deal. Uh, particularly of interest to this uh, presentation will be around the, the unlocking the potential for economic growth, growth, improving places by investing in some of our smaller market towns, but trying to attract people to, to live, work and, and visit in not just our region, but the borders. And we're also sharing this project with Carlisle and uh, the Cumbria Council and also Northumberland. Um, but that's me. So look forward to, to any questions anybody has for me at the, the end. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I think there are a couple of questions for you, so we'll certainly come back to those later. Thanks for your time. Okay, so um, our final speaker, I'll hand it over to Mike Staples, who is the CEO of South of Scotland Community Housing. So over to you, Mike. Thank you for this. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Amy. And uh, good morning, everybody. Just um, a, a quick who we are. Um, South of Scotland Community Housing uh, established in 2006 as Dumfries and Galloway Small Communities Housing Trust, um, initially as, as a reaction to a piece of work that had been undertaken by Shelter uh, that uh, defined a shortfall in, uh, in rural housing in Dumfries and Galloway. Um, our work uh, predominantly sits within the context um, of land reform and community ownership. Um, uh, our work is, is community focused, oriented towards community wide housing, but we'll also work with landowners and employers as well. Um, our work uh, will look at latent need within uh, the rural communities of the south of Scotland, but we're also very focused now on uh, attracting repopulation. Uh, our work is very reliant upon partnership and we work very closely with, with Jamie uh, 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 and have done over the years in Dumfries and Galloway Council. and. Um, uh, just to, to draw upon the point that, that Jamie was making there around the, uh, the, the use by Dumfries and Galloway Council of income on uh, council tax on second homes as a grant fund through the Town Centre Living Fund. That's been a real game changer for us, in actual fact. 
Uh, we're now developing uh, our working relationship with SOCI and we work at a national level um, uh, in terms of policy. Um, really, our work is embedded upon uh, uh, in the, uh, the wider impacts of, of community ownership. So we don't look at housing in isolation. We look at housing as part of the wider mix of community-led regeneration and the impact that can have alongside delivering other things at the same time. Um, we converted uh, from DGSCHTs to SOSH the tail end of last year, and we're currently supporting uh, 16 communities. Um, what I'm going to try and do uh, is, is to illustrate some the, the manner in which some of the projects that we're supporting and have been supporting uh, bring to fruition a number of the kind of policy context elements that have been discussed today. So for us, community-led housing and community-led regeneration are about community resilience, and that's where our work is embedded. Um, we've heard reference to sustaining school roles so many times today, and that's really important to our work, but also being able to support other local services and, and support employers by providing housing for employees. Um, we work uh, on all our projects to identify localised housing need and demand, very localised housing need and demand, but that's not just about the need within a community, it's also about people with links to communities who would be there where there, are, there were suitable housing options and were able to return. Community-led housing is about localised allocation policy or sales with conditions imposed on them through burdens. The significance of this approach is it ensures that housing uh, that's delivered is a primary residence and therefore tackling second homes, holiday homes. We want to ensure that community-led homes that are delivered are lived in um, all the time by people within that community. Also addresses demographic, uh, demographic mix, something that's, that, that, that Russell um, spoke about. Uh, this is by providing housing both for older people and, and for younger families and, and economically active people. Um, so really, we want this, this work to support opportunities to both live and work here in the south of Scotland um, and provide an asset base for community development trusts that can be recycled within that community. So we do all of this uh, by working with communities in the long term. Um, Vicky alluded to the fact that her, her project in uh, Ettrick has taken a very long time. All of these projects do and our approach is to stick in and work uh, with communities over a number of years. So I'm going to uh, talk about uh, two or three of our, our projects. The um, project we're currently working on in Glen Trull um, is very close to our hearts because it's it's been a real battle, I think, to get this project uh, forward towards uh, fruition. Uh, Glen Trull is uh, undoubtedly one of the most fragile and remote communities within Dumfries and Galloway. Um, uh, has already lost its, its school, although that's now provided opportunities for the community. Um, what we've been looking at here is three homes that have been empty now for around three years, and a real concern from the community organisation that they would, these would be lost to local housing supply. This is a really beautiful place um, in the biosphere, dark skies community, and therefore a, a, a real threat of losing housing stock to second homes and holiday homes. Um, so at the moment, we're, we've worked uh, to secure a Scottish Land Fund grant to acquire these properties and a Rural Housing Fund grant to redevelop them. Uh, the acquisition is ongoing at the moment of these three homes and they will be redeveloped to provide safe, warm homes that are allocated. Significance of this project, again, is it's uh, it's not being looked at as housing in isolation. Uh, the community have also taken ownership of the local school, which will uh, become a community hub, providing business and workspace, visitor accommodation, um, space for uh, creative and artistic activities. So here there's going to be a relationship between the housing and people being able to work in this very uh, remote community. Um, the Close Burn Passive House project is a, a new build project that we've recently uh, uh, seen uh, complete. Um, significance of this project, the, the, the Community Development Trust, Nefali Leaf Trust, were very determined uh, to 
um, bring families back into the community, um, but also to address fuel poverty and uh, climate emergency by attaining a very high standard of uh, sustainable design. And in fact, they're the first community owned passive certified homes in Scotland. They've brought three families back into the community, um, addressing issues of homelessness in actual fact, and, and these families are going to contribute uh, to, the, to the school role for years to come. Um, we're still dining out on the fact that uh, the week before last, uh, this project won the Housing and Regeneration Award at the Surf Awards, and I know the guys from the Valley Leaf Trust are on here today. I'm still celebrating, I'm sure, but the real impact of this project has been upon the families and the impact of living in um, high quality, sustainable, warm homes is having on their, their, their lives and that security of tenure that a community is, is able to offer, but the wider impact on the community as well. Um, Ocken Cairn is, is a project that um, we're working on uh, as, as a kind of pilot at the moment, um, and we hope we'll, we'll come forward for delivery in next year. We've completed all the feasibility work in this, both through the Land Fund and the Rural Housing Fund. Um, but what really we're seeking to, to um, achieve here is a template for energy, energy efficient homes with separate workspace delivered for the people that live in the homes. And we feel this is an important template for regeneration, but also an important template for addressing housing uh, post COVID within our rural communities. Um, Wigton Bank of Scotland, I, I'm just gonna mention briefly three projects that, that we've worked on that are um, bringing existing buildings back into use as community led housing and other community business as well. Um, we think this is a really important element of repopulation. It's not just about building new homes, it's also about reusing the existing buildings. And these are the three projects Jamie talked about being recipients of grant from the Town Centre Living Fund. Um, here, Wigton Bank of Scotland uh, became empty when the bank withdrew in 2017 and the community were determined to turn that negative for the community into a positive outcome. Um, the bank was uh, taken into ownership through a, a Scottish Land Fund grant, but following the enactment of community right to buy, um, this project's currently on site and will create two new homes, um, one of which is in the redevelopment of the former um, uh, bank manager house accommodation, uh, but we'll also create a community owned bunkhouse, which was responding to a local demand for affordable accommodation within Scotland's Booktown. Um, so again, there'll be housing, but there will also be a, a business run by the community in creating employment. Um, Russell and Jamie both spoke about Langham Police Station. We've been involved in this project for probably about six years now, I think. Um, the, the building which had been empty for uh, in excess of 10 years, disused as, as a police station, was in uh, the ownership of Dumfries and Galloway Council and via um, community asset transfer has, has come into the ownership of the Estale Foundation, will become uh, four homes uh, of a mix of sizes. And this project is actually nearing completion. And at the moment, we're um, doing some work on uh, um, seeking expressions of interest from prospective tenants. So here, I think the important context uh, is, is providing housing that sits alongside the wider community-led and economic regeneration uh, that Russell spoke about that's going on in Langham, but also the, 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 the broader um, community buyout uh, and ensuring that people who are able to come to Langham now to work have somewhere to live. Last project I'm going to mention, the Grapes Hotel in, in Whithorn, again, disused, empty, derelict for uh, in excess of 30 years, in actual fact, in a real quandary to the, to the community about what could be done with this high profile um, town centre building. Uh, the uh, Development Trust, all uh, roads lead to Whitehorn now own this. Uh, we've just been out to tender for the works and it will provide two large family homes within the hotel and then two additional new builds to the rear. Um, again, we have a context here whereby the same organisation uh, has taken ownership of the town hall and is redeveloping that as a variety of community led and business uses. And we see a very close correlation between the supply of the housing and opportunities that come through the wider activities of the Development Trust. Um, and there I will stop. That's where you can find us if you would like to speak to us. Thank you.
Thank you, Mike. And um, I really like the fact that, you know, housing isn't an isolated issue. It is all part of that community regeneration work. OK, well, we've got some um, questions come in. So um, if everybody's happy to um, start their camera and I can and work through the list of questions. Um, Murdo, uh, the first one's come in was from Fiona and she was asking about whether you aspire to reopen the school. Uh, we have one of our directors was actually the head teacher that was in that school and she's now a head teacher down in Leverburgh in the south of the island. It, it was sort of discussed very briefly but not in any series we know. Um, the nearest, the two nearest schools are still, one's about uh, 11, 12 miles away and the other one's 10 miles away and uh, I don't think the community really support um, looking at reopening the school. I think the costs might be prohibitive. Um, I'm not sure. I, I have no experience in uh, running schools, obviously, and neither of the, many of the directors, apart from the head teacher. So, unless she was really keen, the, the rest would uh, fall in behind. But it's, it's a serious, uh, you know, it was a serious blow to the community. And it definitely does affect. Um, the viability of communities going forward and our demographics and the, and the Outer Hebrides are equally as grim, if not more serious than those on the border. So, yeah, it's a serious issue. And, um, another question for you, Murdo, from Christine. Um, your aim was to increase under fives. How many older children are there and what are the demographics generally? Yeah, the demographics are in good... Um, I think 33% of our residents are over 65. Um, I don't have a percentage for the sort of um, teenage sort of primary to preschool, but I think we're, we're in double, we're in double figures. We sort of, we've had a few families move back. Um, so that's been very encouraging. Um, probably, we're probably talking about 20 at the most, I would think, um, maybe from, a low of five or six, 10 years ago. But just recently, just in the last few months, post um, COVID second lockdown, we've had three local families who already have land, croft land, who are looking to move back and build houses and they've all got kids. So there's actually some positive movement back the way as well, just in recent months. I think it's partly related to the realization that people can have a bit of locational independence as to where they work so they can basically move their work life back to home so that's definitely having an impact. Um, I know um, I just wanted to say that I know that um, Russell you have to leave at quarter past 12 so um, many thanks for joining us today really appreciated your input um, and um, really enjoyed your presentation mm -hmm. so if you do have to go don't worry but thank you very much for being here. All right, it's a pleasure, absolute delight, uh, and I've answered my questions. So if you go into the Q&A box, I've, I've hopefully answered both the questions as well. But Amy, if people have other questions, happy to answer them and just get them to um, send them to either me or Jane. OK, thank you. Thanks, Russell. Bye, folks. Um, and just another final question for you, Murdo. Um, can you explain how the shared equity approach works? Um, yeah, well, it's the how we sold the land to the housing association. Um, well, so basically, the land was transferred to them for what it cost the trust to develop and put services. And there was a road, a shared road in from the main road and the water and electric. So that cost was recouped. And then the housing association built the properties and then uh, they, they, was, they sold them on. And it's shared equity. I not 100% sure, 30%, maybe up to 30% is a shared equity stake. And they can either um, purchase over, ye over a certain number of years, they can buy that back out, or it can be sold on as a, as a, as a continual shared equity. Um, we have looked at another site, two sites actually, and I've heard others men mention the affordability issue. And the Housing Association looked at developing another two sites, but the most recent one, um, prices came in at quarter of a million per three bedroom unit developed and it was just too expensive and that's happened twice just recently and I think um, materials costs have increased but also the impact of the new um, sort of 
zero carbon uh, building costs are, are really significant. And uh, we looked at the school originally as well as tra for transferring that and into a housing unit and refurbishing it. But the costs for doing that compared to the costs for, uh, for business units was astronomical and really quite unaffordable. Um, so that's a real issue. It, it, it would have been cheaper actually to flatten the school and build a new build. So these are, uh, we hadn't anticipated that um, sort of refurbishing older properties would be so expensive, but it's, it's really eye-wateringly expensive. Okay, so um, next question for Callum from Mary in um, Langham. In the Highlands, house building in rural areas seems to be included in planning frameworks, but in the South, it seems, still seems that new houses must be located with, within existing communities. Should it be reviewed? Um, well, I think that's, that's a really important question. Um, because clean housing, as, as we've already been discussing, is, is central to, to any rural, rural repopulation initiatives that, that take place in, in the south of Scotland or, or elsewhere. Um, I mean, I, I think the critical, and I say this as a non-planner, so I should put that kind of health, health warning in advance. I think the, the, the critical issue now when we're thinking about the, the next um, the national planning framework, NPF4, and, and how that's going to shape a, the ways in which uh, local development plans are, are put together uh, is, is a really important opportunity to think about how and where we might want to um, locate housing and getting access to land with regard to that. So that's a kind of ongoing uh, debate as the, uh, and, and set of consultations as the um, NPF4 uh, framework is, is being developed. So I think one of the things that's, that's important in all of this is, is just uh, to think about how we can actually potentially do things differently with regard to uh, how rural repopulation can, can fit into to local development strategies, I think. Um, you know, and, and the Planning Act is a, is, a, is a really good example of that. I remember way back in when, when we were consult, when the consultations were going on for this, um, for that bill uh, initially back in, in 2018, sitting with, with a number of other stakeholders and with, with, with some of the, the civil servants that were um, managing the, the bill itself and, and explaining that we were keen to have um, rural repopulation as part of the, the bill's provisions uh, and, and being told, well, that's all very useful and important, but this is, a, this is a bill about simplifying the planning system. Now, that bill is the most amended bill in the history of the Scottish Parliament for various reasons. Uh, so it has become uh, a, a quite different beast from what it, it set out to, to be in, initially. And I think in, in, in many respects is, is better for that. And I think the fact that there is a focus on rural repopulation is an important dimension of it. So I suppose what I'm saying is things change and kind of focus changes as well. And the pandemic and the post-pandemic recovery around um, you know, a, a green recovery, community resilience, digital recovery, and all, and, and all these different issues give an opportunity, albeit with, you know, scarce resources, of course, uh, and, and having to use them effectively and smartly. It gives us an opportunity to think about how we might want to um, connect up different policy areas so they're not necessarily um, as siloed as they sometimes can be, and having uh, that different approach and being open to the opportunities for um, resettlement uh, of land and, and uh, being clear as to, to where land is going to be allocated for housing in ways that perhaps aren't necessarily uh, done in, in, in the usual conventional ways needs to be part of that conversation and, and policy development, I would say. Thank you, Callum. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to volunteer or we might get um, a couple of um, answers for this from David. Um, how do we avoid community-led social housing not feeling like social engineering? Um, yeah, I'll have a go at that one, I guess. Um, and uh, <clears throat> this is actually an issue we're beginning to do some work with David around, so hopefully that's a pertinent question. I mean, I think that's, it's a bit of a balan balancing act because, you know, com the community organisations will always have a perspective around what they hope to achieve through the project. Um, Closeburn is quite a good example of that, whereby, as, as I mentioned before, they had a, the, the group had a very clear view that they wanted to 
deliver homes that would help sustain the school and therefore bring new families into the community. Um, but that balance is always undertaken alongside trying to do a, as, as robust as possible an, a, an analysis of, of uh, housing needs and demand locally. So we understand who's there, the needs of the houses or who could be coming into the community that needs the houses and, and how the development responds to that. But also placing that within a, uh, the context of an allocations policy that means that uh, decisions can be made around who lives in the houses that, that is responsive um, to those kind of both the strategy but the need that's that's been demonstrated. Um, I guess this one is more focused at you Jamie but um, I'm not sure whether you would be able to um, talk on the public transport side but um, have you got any suggestions about um, what plans there are to work alongside public transport um, with regards to rural housing? Yeah, uh, thanks, Amy. I, I did see that question come up, and in, in terms of our uh, our role in developing the local housing strategy, we obviously try and align that with our regional transport strategies as much as possible. And the identification of, of rural sites often involves a simple element of looking at what the local bus timetables are in terms of services that that are running through the, those areas. But as sort of has been alluded to in many of the presentations. We're really looking to maximise some of the strategic benefits from any affordable housing developments that come up. And as, as Mike was saying there, that the, the projects in the likes of Whithorn and Wigton that are seeking to identify employment opportunities as part of the, the wider community uh, benefit uh, and around the inclusive growth to make sure that that people have uh, employment opportunities within easy walking distance or, or cycling distance. Uh, maybe not being so reliant on on, on public transport if if possible, um, you know, in a rural area, the the fragility of public transport is well known, um, and it, it, an, an element of that does come down to uh, supply and demand, uh, and the, the, where where we can locate more people in some of these rural areas, the the aim is that that will help to sustain the the the, the transport as well. Um, it's we, we don't do it as a sort of well we'll build there and hope that that does sustain the public transport we are trying to work very closely and one of the examples would be we're, we're heavily involved with uh, the local transport agency down here Swiss Trans through our, our climate emergency uh, work, working group um, and that, that's predominantly officers within the council but some partner organizations and we try and promote the use of, of public transport as much as possible so there is joined up working, um, and we are we are trying to effectively sustain those those services for rural communities, uh, wherever we possibly can. But the, the the main aspiration is to try and identify employment opportunities within you know, within walking or, or wheeling distance. The the the, the aspiration of twenty minute neighbourhoods shouldn't necessarily just be applied to to towns and cities. It's also something we can aspire for for our more rural areas as well. Thanks, Jamie. And more of a general question, really, from me, um, for whoever wants to answer it. But in terms of the costs and making these things more cost effective, is it? Do you think that if we get sort of a cumulative mass and the more projects that are up and running, it will inspire more action in these areas? That you know the cost can come down, or that councils are more willing to, to fund this area? Yeah, the cost, sorry, I mean, I'll, I'll just quickly come in on cost because that is something that, that does come up on a regular basis. And that was one of the, the main drivers in establishing the, the council's town centre living fund was to help to try and, and meet that gap. And it's, it's certainly recognised, and I, I don't think the borders will be any different from Dumfries and Galloway in this, that without the, the public sector putting money into these projects, they, they effectively wouldn't stack up. So that's why we're often looking for those strategic benefits, as, as Murdo was alluding to there as well. Quarter of a million pounds a unit is unfortunately becoming a, a sort of standard figure, um, especially in some of our more rural areas. When we're not surprised when that, that's, that sort of figure comes up for development. 
but the I, I would be hopeful that as the, the the new technologies and the new standards come out that we do start to see that the greater demand for extra energy efficiency or the higher the higher cost of insulation are, are recognized and that does start to bring the the overall cost down it's often what happens with new technologies and new provision um but i think in rural areas we will always recognize that there's going to be a that we're not able to deliver those economies of scale as effectively as they can in the, the cities and, and larger towns. Yeah, I would, I would just add to that that this, I mean, probably for us, this is this is our number one challenge, and um, that uh, it's it's very the, the hardest part of any of these projects is 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 going out to the market, and uh, you know the 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 skills base, the the contractor market where we are is is challenging. Um, it's something that SOCI are obviously very aware of and 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 want to address. Um, the pandemic has undoubtedly increased the cost of development. Um, on a number of our projects, we find ourselves with quite a big gap between where we started in terms of cost and where we are now. Um, and uh, you know the 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 level of grant doesn't go up. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's it, it's a challenge for. For us, and I mean, a, a project like Closeburn, uh, we, we community were determined to deliver to passive standard, but we we had to bring in a contractor from the central belt to do that. So you know, we want to move away from that situation and and be able to work with people locally. We've lost Amy, I think. I think we might have lost Amy there. Oh, she's come off. <laughs> um, um, I think if got... Sorry, oh, Becky, on you go. I was just going to um, agree with Mike. That the costs that came back for Kirkup um, were so much higher than we'd expected when we started out on the project. But we wanted to make sure they were affordable to live in and with low energy costs. So our houses are they're going to have ground source heating and they've got PV panels, very high standard of insulation. They're all um, going to be EPCA rated, but it, it is costly. Um, hence, we're looking at borrowing 600,000 pounds, which is a huge amount for a, a small community organization to take on. Sorry, I lost my signal there. Um... Thank you for that answer. Um, and I think Fiona was just uh, making a comment um, on Murdo's answer about um, their linked relevant qualifications to the curriculum. And um, if anyone wants a copy of that, um, she's happy to share that. Uh, David uh, lives in a rural village, 20 minutes from Dumfries. I don't know if you had a question there, David, that you want to add to that. I think there's just a question before that, Amy, about building contractors again. I haven't got that, Kerry. Could you okay. read it out, please? There are a number of self-employed building contractors in my community. I wonder if a vehicle could be created to enable them to come together to submit tenders as the associated paperwork may be off-putting for them. Yeah, I think that it's a shame, David, that... Um... Uh, Russell's not still on to answer that question because that's certainly something that, that, that we know that, that SOCI are, are, are looking at being able to kind of pull the resource of, of um, SME and smaller contractors um, and I, I agree that would be a, a, a benefit uh, to the scale of work we're doing. David, oh, odd. he was asking about modular housing. Have you come across that, Mike? Yes, is the answer to that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's not something we've done any, anything with. Um, I think uh, a, a lot of you guys will have seen the project that's being done at the moment uh, at uh, Alva Ferry on Mull, which is a rural housing fund project being delivered via the Wee House Company. Uh, delivering modular homes that are built in uh, west of Ayrshire. Um, so yeah, we know there are a few plans afoot around this type of thing in in the south of Scotland uh, at the moment, and it's something we'd like to see. And again, it's about that issue of of uh, trying to uh, control cost through delivery, um, but it's not something we've done thus far. Thank you. Um, and Fiona, 
love to pursue them linked to the school's agenda. A statement from Future Learning. I think that's all the questions. Um, just thanks again, everybody, for being part of this event today about re rural repopulation, particularly for the South. Really appreciate your time. Um, it's been a great um, conversation and much needed conversation. And um, thank you once again. So um, that's it, everybody. The video will be available on Vimeo in a few days. If you have any questions, um, please find my contact details on the Community Land Scotland website and I'll be happy to get back to you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. See you. Thank you.